Welcome to a transformational experience. The Bible says it is our hiding place and it preserves us from trouble. The interpretation and practical application of the word. It is in the will of God to preserve you from trouble. It is in the mindset of God to preserve his own. The Bible says that I'll give up nations for your sake. Welcome to Epelusis Ministries International with Apostle Jonathan Kajimu. Beloved viewers, you're welcome. My name is Jonathan Kajim, and you're welcome to this broadcast. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the beautiful opportunity and experience that you have given us to share your word. And as we share your word, may you speak and minister to us. May you uplift us. Um, may you align our future. May you frame our destinies. May you awaken people's callings. May you awaken people to the assignments and callings that you've ordained them for in the name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus. Today we are talking about baptism. Baptism. Praise God. Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 to 17. Matthew chapter 3. Verses 13 to 17, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to, to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. 16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Praise the Lord Jesus. John, some people refer to him as John the Baptist, um, was such a peculiar man of God, chosen from his mother's womb. You remember that time when um, Mary visits Elizabeth and the boy John receives the baptism of the Spirit even when he was still in his mother's womb. That is the kind of anointing that was upon John for some that prefer for clarity because there are other Johns in the scriptures. So for clarity, they want to, they, they, they add on to say is John the Baptist. But it was, scriptures literally call him John. They add on the Baptist because of the role and responsibility and the kind of assignment that God put on his life. But it's basically John. So John had a peculiar life from the time he's born. We remember that incident when Mary met Elizabeth and the baby in her leaped, the baby in her rejoiced, and that baby was actually John the Baptist. So he grows up uh, from the wilderness. He was separated from his mother's womb, anointed with the Spirit from the time he was in his mother's womb. He grows up and the Lord separates him in, in the deserts, in the wilderness. And that's where he had quite a number of years for his life. And I believe this experience was so expedient for his life and paramount. For the end result that God wanted to do in his life. And never should you ever forget the fact that we go through things in life. But they are to a certain end. The things that we experience in our lives, the way people treat us, good or bad, in a way has a certain sort of preparation it does to our lives. There are many children that have grown up with stepmothers and they have become the best in life. Why? Because at the moment nobody was on their side, actually God was. 
and you should never forget in life, anytime you ever feel abandoned by anybody or anything, remember that God is on your side. People who have grown up from the poorest state in life have actually become something in this life. People, everyone cast and said you will never amount up to anything. God has lived to, to disapprove such statements. And that's why I want to say to you, if there is anybody in your life who made a statement on your life that you will never be X or Y or you will never mount up to anything in life, well, their words have an end. But God is limitless. God will see to it that you become the thing that you ordained you to be. The Bible says that I am the Lord that has good plans for you. Plans to prosper you, to give you that hope, that future. And the scriptures say that expected end. There is an expected end that God has for everyone. The question is, do you have in your thoughts that end? Do you expect a certain end in your life? Praise the Lord. Because when you look at the life of John, grown up, he wasn't given the opportunity like any other child had in his day to play football if it was even there. All the games of that time, John never had the chance, he never had that opportunity to be like any other child. Praise the Lord. He didn't have the opportunity to live an ordinary life of any other child probably who went to school. And this is the end of life that we do not live for ourselves. We live for God. And the most important aspect in life is to discover the thing that God created you to do. Is to discover your purpose, the reason for your existence. Why are you alive? Why do you breathe? Why do you wake up every day? And you're living. There must be a reason as to why you are alive. Praise the Lord. And until you find the reason why you are alive, you might never find satisfaction. And I mean ultimate satisfaction in life. Praise the Lord Jesus. Many people never had the opportunity to even speak a language. Because for one reason or another they were aborted. Or sickness killed them. Or poverty destroyed them. And they never had the opportunity to live to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. But if you're alive and you're hearing these words, then there is a reason why you are still breathing. There is a reason beyond education. There is a reason beyond religion. There must absolutely be a reason beyond the things that, that our minds can relate with. Hallelujah. And I always say, if you ever want to discover your purpose in life, then don't forget that purposes are discovered when we find the man that created us. Because when we find our creator, it is easy to find the reason why we were created. Oftentimes people want to find their purposes in life besides God. True satisfaction in life is in God. There is nothing that will ever bring satisfaction to any individual than the God who made them. Praise the Lord. So going back, John had a peculiar life. He wasn't like any other child of his time. God separates him from his mother's womb and he calls him to prepare the way for the Lord. So he was in the wilderness for the longest period of his time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He was in the wilderness. God commanded him that he would eat locusts and honey. That's all he had. That is all God apportioned for him. And he was in the wilderness for most of his time. Hallelujah. He is a man that was fully dedicated to the service of God. This is the same man that prophesied the coming of our Lord Jesus. He said, the one that is coming after me is greater than I. Hallelujah. The one that is coming after me is greater than I. And he says in his word, 
whose shoes I am not, whose shoe lash, la, la, lashes I am not even worthy to untie. And it has a lot of meaning there. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> we are given a story in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13, of how Jesus comes from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized of John. And John refused to baptize Jesus. And he says, who am I that you should come unto me? He recognized the sovereignty that was upon the Christ. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, Jesus said it is needful that I fulfill all righteousness. Because this was the order God had set at that time. The Bible says that remove not the ancient landmarks that were set by your forefathers. Jesus comes in that experience of one who honors the order that God has put. That this is the anointing God has put in the land. I ought to honor it. Paul in his own words gives us an experience. And he says um, he went to those that were of reputation in Jerusalem. Men and women that had gone ahead of him. And he submitted the message to them. And he says, lest I should run or I'd run in vain. In every generation, God will always set men and women that are ahead of you. It is always important that you go to those knees and seek for counsel, pertaining the ministry God has put upon your life. When this thing came of Epilusis, I had to search out those that in my heart I considered men of God, not that they are Others are not, but those that I felt could understand my burden. And I sat down with them and said, this is what I feel in my heart. This is the kind of life I feel God has called me to live. What's your opinion? Because it would be very possible for me to run up and down with a ministry that is not going to last a while. It was very possible for me to even run but when I'm running in vain, it is very possible for people to, to run when they are running races that were not ordained for them. Look at men and women that have been prophesied to that they are pastors. Yet the, the fellow, there is nothing as a pastor in him. And some have ended up carrying burdens that they were not even supposed to carry. Why? Because it is too hard to even convince them that you're not supposed to be a pastor. That probably God has called you in this line of career and he will bless you there. He will multiply you there. He will increase you there. You will thrive there. You will increase there. Praise God. Man of God gives a story one day and he says some people will go to heaven and God will ask them, what were you doing on earth? And they will say, you know, you see, I was a pastor. And God will tell them, but you were supposed to be a chief usher in so-and-so's church. That story taught me one thing, that it is very possible to run a race that was not ordained for you. It is very possible to even live a life that God had not ordained for you. Well, you can receive 30, 60-fold. You can even test a, more than a ounce of, of success. You can increase and multiply in the same. Yet it is not the thing that God called you for. It is not the assignment God gave you. It wasn't even a second assignment that God had taken from one person to give it to you. No, you simply ran a race that you were not ordained to. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, John the Baptist is one of those people that teach us that amazing thing. That it is important um, to honor people that have gone ahead of you. And the same is, 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 is in the life of our Lord Jesus. He looks at John and he says it is important that all righteousness is fulfilled. And he bows down to be baptized by John the Baptist. Yet he knew very well that the kind of anointing that is upon me, look, this is Christ, the anointed one. 
This is the embodiment of the definition of true anointing of God. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. The one everyone wrote about in the Old Testament. Scriptures tell us he himself speaks and says from John, from, from, from the law and the prophets, he expounded unto them the things that concern him. In the law, in the Psalms, and of all that is written. This guy, Jesus, is the true definition of the anointing of God. But he bows down to John to baptize him. And he says it is important that things are done rightly. Hallelujah. It is, it is probable and it is true that God will anoint us more than the people that mentored us. But we require a certain humility to sit under those feet. To sit under their teachings and learn what we ought to learn. It is by divine principle that a child will be richer than their parents. And consequently, your grandchildren will do way more than you did. Praise the Lord. But the humility of heart for you to know that God has called you for more and you're still able to sit down and listen. People who don't listen die quicker. Because everyone in life must have a hear to be able to listen. But most importantly, who do you listen to? The Bible says, take heed what you hear. In the other gospel, it says, take heed how you hear. And also, it is important to know from whom you learn. Not everyone will teach you. No. Not every pastor on that TV will teach you. And it is very important to find and know the kind of people our spirits are so at ease and free with. Because when we do, we realize how quick it is for God to grow us. The Bible says that he called prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, and pastors for the perfecting of saints. It also means to fully furnish, to equip, to enable growth of the saints. Hallelujah. When we look through scripture, there are quite a number of baptisms. Number one, there was what they call the baptism of Moses. There is also the baptism of the dead. I think some of you have read extra biblical books, those that were not made of the part of the canon. One of them, I think, is Sirach. It speaks of the baptism of the dead. <laughs> and some tenants are also, you know, depicted as you read the word. Uh, speaking of the baptism of the dead. Then in the law there were also other baptisms. The washing of hands. The washing of feet. Um, and, and so many other washings. That happened. Ritual, rituals of baptism in the scriptures. That's why they have a problem with Jesus. When his disciples eat food minus washing their hands. That wasn't against the laws of hygiene. No it wasn't. That was. That, 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 that was more of an introduction of a dispensation that is not tied to rituals and traditions. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 1 verses 4. The Bible says, <clears throat> Let's begin from verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Have you heard what John was preaching? John did baptize in the wilderness. And preached 
the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. What is the one message John came with? Repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. What is the one message Jesus comes with? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it is literally meaning that change your mind. Because there is a thing that takes away sin. So the ministry of John is more on change your mind. Because there is a realm coming. And this realm is not about what I did to qualify. No. There is a realm coming where a woman with, with an emorrhage will touch the, the cloak of the Lord and she will immediately be healed. There is a realm coming that is reconciling fathers back to their, to their children. There is a realm coming and it is bigger and it is good that you change your mind. Hallelujah. The Bible says John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Verse 5 says, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And he goes on to, 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 you know, to speak many, many, many other things as we read. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He preached the gospel, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. He told them change. Because the word repentance is metanoia in the Greek language, which means change your mind. We have all probably lived around churches that have emphasized more of repentance. Praise the Lord. But look, repentance can only be repentance when there is a change of mind. Where a person is moving in direction X and they say no, that is not the direction I'm meant to move in. And they turn back. Repentance is not just the confession of God, I am sorry, I'll never do it again, and you find yourself doing it again. All people who have addictions have prayed the prayer of God, I'll never do it again. And they did it again, why? Because the prayer was based on their human effort, trying to fulfill the promise of God. But if you ever change your prayer to pray like this, to say, God, I trust in your grace, that works in me both to will and to do, and by your strength I rely to you, that I will not go that way again. Praise the Lord Jesus. But oftentimes the people, their prayers, are more inclined to their own personal ability and power than it is the available power of God that is able to deliver. The Bible says he has not handed he, he, he delivered Jacob, he has ransomed Jacob from the hand of him that was mightier than he. It is God that must rescue you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. John chapter 2 verses 22 shows us that um, Jesus was actually baptized by John. The Bible says, when therefore he was risen from the dead. When you read the Bible, you realize that actually... Jesus didn't baptize anyone. As shocking as that is, it is actually true. He had disciples, yes. Scriptures give us narrations where he was. He washed their feet. He fed with them. He moved with them while preaching the gospel. But he didn't baptize anyone. Hallelujah. But I want us to look at the kind of the baptism of our Lord. Having looked at the baptism of John, the one of dipping in water. Because I want you to understand that the word baptism comes from the word baptizo, which means to dip in water. Praise the Lord. But as you read scripture, you see the baptism of John, but also you see the baptism of our Lord Jesus. And what is that kind of baptism? Mark chapter 1 verses 8. The Bible says indeed, I've baptized you with water, 
but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Indeed, I have baptized you with water, but he indeed shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. These are two kinds of baptism. There is one baptizing with water, there is another one baptizing with the Holy Ghost. And when you read it for the first time, it is contradicting. And I understand if you feel like that. Because, listen, the guy is saying, John, Mark chapter 1 verses 8, Indeed, I've baptized you with water. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus. Hallelujah. I have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. These are two kinds of baptisms. There is one of the water and one of the Spirit. One is of John, one is of our Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And that is the, the Jesus kind of baptism. The one where he baptizes with fire and the Holy Ghost. And no wonder when he's going up to heaven, the Bible says that he, he assembled all of them and told them, do not get out of Jerusalem until ye are endued with power from on high. Until you are endued with power from on high. And he says, I'll give you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And when he's come upon you, which is the baptism of the Spirit. So the first experience of the baptism of the Spirit is the one we see in Acts chapter 2 um, from verses 1. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is the first time we see the baptism of the Spirit. Because he told them, when the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. The one evidence that the Spirit of God has come upon an individual is in their willingness to witness. You cannot claim that the Spirit of God came upon you and you speak in other tongues when you don't witness. You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be an evangelist. There must be an opportunity for you to preach the gospel and win someone over to the kingdom. The Bible says he who wins souls is wise. You must attain a certain wisdom by winning souls to God. Because heaven rejoices over one soul. You, you look through social media every day and people are throwing parties, parties, parties. It is, you know, it is everywhere. Bridal shower, Kuchara shower, witch shower. I, I, I recently saw that even men are done for groom shower. <sighs> Praise God. But look, men are throwing parties. But they have an end. And they end. But think about it when you make parties in heaven. When we're at university and every time we'd preach the gospel of door-to-door -door open air, we'll say we need to make some parties in heaven. When was the last time you made a party in heaven? When was the last time you witnessed? Because he says, when the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. Witness. In Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. When was the last time you were a witness? But Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 gives us the true experience of the baptism of the Spirit. Because that is the first time we see it. Actually the scriptures tells us that they were in the upper room every day when you read Acts chapter 1. And they had all things in common. They prayed, sat down together until that fateful day that is ordained by the Lord. That the Spirit of God came upon them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Acts 19 verses 5. The Bible says, When they heard this, they were baptized. Okay, let's begin from verse 
1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper courts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as had where, where, whether there be any Holy Ghost. Did you receive the Holy Spirit in, when you believed? And they say, Oh, you know, we've never had anything called the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 says, And he said unto them, and to what then were you baptized? And they said unto Johnny's baptism. Do you realize there are two kinds of baptisms again? And to what then were you baptized? And they said unto Johnny's baptism. Then, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Listen to that saying unto the people that they should believe on him, we should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Some people got stuck in the baptism of John. They, are, they even call themselves Baptists. Praise the Lord. Because to them that was the end of the book. Yet there is so much more after. He's saying, unto what then were you baptized? Unto what were you then baptized? Year 2014, we are in Uganda for a mission. And... We enter Iganga as a university mission team. And there was a fracas that had happened in that land. A pastor, so to speak, went to baptize a young Muslim girl who had given her life to Christ in the river. And both of them drowned and died. And to what was that girl baptized into? Another story, another story is told of a woman that is taken to be baptized. And the moment they put her in the water, bringing her out, she had lost her mind. And to what then was she baptized into? Oh, pastor, you sound as though you're against the baptism of water. I was baptized in water too. Yes, in Gerenge. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I was baptized. I was baptized as well. I'm not against the baptism of water, but I'm trying to show you that there is a higher truth. It is truth also. And I, if you're not baptized, I recommend you they go and baptize you. Hallelujah. But for a person on deathbed, is it even important? At that point, they are believing Jesus. It is not. But I want to show you who, you who still has an opportunity to learn and experience God more and dive in there that there is a higher truth about baptism. Praise the Lord Jesus. So it tells them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John his baptism. Verse 4 says, then Paul, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. The Bible says, verses 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6 says, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. That is the true experience of baptism hallelujah praise the lord jesus christ acts chapter 10 another another one cornelius's house there was a certain man in caesarea called cornelius a centurion of the band called the italian band a devout man and one that feared god with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the night hour of the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy harms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou owest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and devoid soldiers of them that waited on him continually. And he narrated to, he, to them all these things. Uh, so the Lord appears in a vision to Peter when you read down and Peter sees 
uh, what is forbidden and he says, God tells him kill and eat and he refuses to eat. Acts 10 verses 44, the Bible says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which had the word. Which had the word, not the words. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came, in, came, came with Peter, because that on Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that this should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they to tarry for some days. What was the most important thing? The most important thing was not the baptism of the water. It comes after. The most important thing was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says while Peter spoke these things, the Holy Ghost fell on them and they received the Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues. But because he was also held in tradition, he says, let's baptize them in water. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Acts 8.38 gives us a narration of how Philip baptizes the eunuch. Acts 8.38. The Bible says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Praise the Lord. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. The guy teleported after baptizing the guy in water. It is okay to be baptized in the water. I only want to say there is a higher place, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Acts 9 verses 18. We see that also Paul um, was actually baptized. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. That is the baptism of water. Praise the Lord. So even Paul, as a man, was also baptized. But later we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14, a contention that arises because of this baptism. The Bible says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus. Actually, when you read from... Um, from verse 11, the Bible says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Kilo, that there are contentions among you. What was the cause of the contentions? Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. And I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Also Paul baptized Gaius in the water. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. So even in the baptism of water, you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And he continues to say, And I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Eh? Read it very well. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And in verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Do you want to know the power of God? Get to know the cross of our Lord Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 4. The Bible says there is one body, there is one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Praise the Lord. So there is one body, there is one spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe you've been able to learn a lot today that baptism is actually the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I do not disqualify again, I say, the baptism of water. I was baptized. But I'm saying after that baptism of water, seek for one that is higher. Praise the Lord Jesus. 
seek for one that is better. If you're there and you have any sickness in your body right now in the name of Jesus, I speak and release the life of God to touch you where you are right now in the name of Jesus. These words that we speak, they are spirit and they are life. May it quicken your mortal body. Right now in the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, say these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you as my personal Lord and Savior. I am born again. You're born again. Glory to God. We love you. And just get to the numbers down on the screen. And I'm quite persuaded the Lord will definitely bless you. You will grow. You will increase. You will flourish. You will multiply. The goodness of the Lord is upon you. Otherwise, from me and the media team here, we love you and bye.